if I can get it to work. <laughs> oh, sorry. So at Stantic, um, we pride ourselves on on um, our uh, people, um, and our core values is to ensure that our people get to work safe, are safe in work, and and get to their families. So what we want to do when we start off a meeting is we will do a safety moment, which is a brief um, moment where we discuss certain elements on on safety. Um, with today's topic. Um, I thought it was um, quite prevalent to um, talk about flooding. So in Australia, flooding um, is becoming far more of a frequent occurrence. Um, what with increased rainfall intensities um, and more frequent rainfall events, um, you quite often hear in the news about um, flooding events. Now, some of um, regarding keeping safe um, through flood events, um, if a large storm event or it's forecasted for a large storm event, it's always a good to away from areas of low topography because what you can almost guarantee is large storm events, the areas of low topography are where the storm water is going to run to. So try and stay away from those areas wherever possible. And um, no, never ever go into um, flood waters. So never or drive a vehicle into flood waters because what you might end up um, having is something like this poor unfortunate um, person on the on the image there. So um, just a quick more. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, here's just a brief run through. Um, so we're going to talk about what integrated water cycle management is. Um, we'll briefly touch on why it's important. Um, why it's relevant to the North Arm Cove area in particular. Um, and then we'll talk about the three main um, arms of, of integrated water management, which is the stormwater, puddle water, and wastewater. So what is integrated water cycle management? So integrated water cycle management talks about joint management of water resources through urban precincts. Um, so spanning um, as I've already mentioned, um, water, wastewater, and stormwater. So what you can see on the slide there is uh, an idea, a very general snack of how the water cycle management might work through uh, an urban area. So you can see there you've got the evaporation coming out of water bodies such as the sea or lakes. Um, that then um, falls as precipitation on higher areas where we generally look to collect it. So there might be man-made reservoirs or um, natural lakes where we collect that water um, so we can store it for a long period of time. We then take that water and we direct it towards water treatment plants. So that water treatment plant will take that water and we'll clean it to a point where we can use it as potable water. Quite often from that treatment plant, it would then be taken to a storage facility so that you can um, get the water whenever it's required. From that storage facility, then feed into the domestic use um, network. So that's where you get your water from um, when you turn on the tap in your house. And generally, as a rule, um, the wastewater that comes from your house, so from your showers, from your machines, from your toilets, that would then be directed towards a water purifying plant where they would take out um, all the, the bio waste um, and the nutrients, clean that water up, and either use it to irrigate. So you could use it for irrigating open spaces or for irrigating agriculture. Or they take that water and they discharge that water back into the natural water system where it then goes through the cycle. Um, what we also have in that image there is something that's become far more um, prevalent throughout the world is a desalination plant. So a desalination plant is an alternative way of, of getting potable water. So what that plant does is it, it basically takes water out of the sea, um, it, it extracts the salt from it, it treats it, and then it feeds it back to the potable water supply. So that's, that's just a, a really high level um, schematic of, of what water cycle management system may be. So why is the water cycle management system important? So what we look at, the two main things when we're looking at the development of a water cycle management um, system is we want to maximize our efficient use of the natural resource. 
right? So you'll hear on the news, you know, everybody knows in Australia that there's a lot of drought happening um, in Australia. We're not getting as much rainfall in those areas. Um, so that, that causes issues with how much um, natural resource we have. So what we want to do is maximize our efficient use of that resource. And then also importantly, we want to minimize our impact on the natural environment. So we don't want to be polluters. I'm sure nobody wants to be a polluter. Um, we don't want to be drawing too much water out of the natural system so that it's affecting the ecosystem um, and causing um, you know, excessive drought in the areas. So that's what we're, we're generally looking at. So integrated water cycle management is, is generally an engineered system um, within a urban context that we try and get to match the natural water cycle as much as possible. So when I talk about the natural water cycle, I'm pretty sure everybody has a general understanding of it. What we're talking about is evaporation from water bodies, condensation, precipitation on high areas, and then runoff down through creeks and, and uh, rivers um, back into the, the sea, where it then goes through again. In addition to that, you also have infiltration. So where water seeps through the ground and into the groundwater table below and then migrates towards the, the water bodies. So that's what we're trying to um, copy when we're, we're trying to do a, an integrated water management system. So a well-designed integrated water management system um, will look to slot into the natural water cycle um, in a sensitive and sustainable way. Right, so what we're trying to do is minimize the impact that we're having by having that system in there. So what are the benefits of having a good integrated water cycle management system? So obviously we've touched upon the environmental benefits. So if you have a good system that isn't drawing too much water out and is polluting at the downstream end, you're obviously having a minimum impact on the environment. So um, there's a real opportunity there to, to maximize our our soft approach to, to um, dealing with water through through urban can. Increased livability, um, we'll probably touch on this a little bit later in the presentation, but um, as um, the market matures, um, and as we look at new innovative ways of, of undertaking urban design, there's a far greater um, need and want for increasing livability in urban places. So a lot of that can be driven by having um, open space, um, vegetated areas, um, trees. Um, so what water sensitive urban design tries to do and integrated water cycle management tries to do is incorporate that into the design. It's also when you have open spaces and open water bodies through um, a precinct or through an area, um, it has a big impact on reducing urban uh, heat impact. So that's a big thing at the moment. Um, and obviously, being able to reduce that urban heat island effect um, increases livability quite considerably. So then sustainability, we talk about. So if you can get a good system that's set up, you're going to increase the design life of that system. You're going to reduce the maintenance requirements. You're going to reduce the impact on the environment. Um, you can get a system that, that almost runs itself. So that's really what you want to do. You want to get to that point where it fits in with the natural water cycle and, and it's a really sustainable um, approach. And then finally, we've got their diversification. So when I talk about diversification, what I'm talking about is getting water from different areas and discharging water in different ways. So historically, um, usually what happens is you would get water, bubble water from the water authority. Um, they would collect it from a, a number of diverse sources, but you would basically get it from the articulation pipe work in the street. Um, it's one source, um, so you don't really have much option on how you get your potable water. Um, if that source was to dry up, you wouldn't have any potable water. What this having system uh, does is it allows you to have diversification on how you actually get your water. And same with discharge, right? So you're not only discharging to a waste treatment plant, you have diversification on how you discharge your water. So if one system becomes overloaded, you can compensate by, by putting more pressure on the other systems. So it brings in that diversity. So, so far, it's all been all good news. Uh, but obviously, like anything, there are challenges 
um, that, that are always faced when you're looking to incorporate something, particularly if it's new. So a couple of the challenges that we find that we face on a, when trying to, to bring these um, systems on, on to programs um, that are planning and regulatory, regulatory frameworks that, that we have to get through. So particularly the regulatory frameworks, um, there are a good number of um, guidelines and frameworks that have been set up uh, by the state government, by local water authorities um, for the provision of potable water, how to recycle water um, and how to discharge wastewater. Those are really focused around ensuring the health of the users. So they're, they're a good idea, they need to be there, um, but like most frameworks, um, they usually take a very conservative approach and that conservative approach can often hinder um, the incorporation of innovation into, into new projects. Um, impact on development is also another one. So obviously a lot of these, and you'll see as we, show, as we look through examples, a lot of these uh, pieces of infrastructure take up quite a bit of space. Um, if you're talking about you know, open water bodies, if you're talking about public open space, uh, they take up developable land. So what you often find is developers are under an increased amount of pressure to maximize their development potential on a piece of land, and they're very reluctant to give up developable land in order to incorporate these systems. So there's always a back and forward um, with that in order to, to get some sort of alignment on what the impact of development is. The next thing is capital investment. So again, with these pieces of infrastructure, generally they need to be built up front um, so that then it can service the, the community as the community comes on board. That costs money. So historically how that's happened is usually the water authorities will invest um, in that infrastructure and then we as the users will pay that back over time. Um, if you have a scenario where there is no water authority, someone else has to come up with a capital investment. So how do you come up with that capital investment? It's something that the community pays for up front and then get a reduction in rates going forward. Or is it something where you bring on a private uh, authority to supply that entity and then you pay back to them with rates? Um, and then finally, I've got in their perception. So in Australia, um, there's a general perception that sort of stigma that goes around um, the use of recycled water. Right? So even though nature recycles water, um, there's a perception that Mother Nature can do better than engineers can, um, and that might be the case. Um, so there's a perception you have to get around. So if you are looking at incorporating measures that are going to use a lot more recycled water for, for uh, people um, in their day-to-day -day usage of, of water, you have to get around that perception that recycled water is dirty water. Um, so you have to battle with that perception. You need to make sure that the community is on board with that so that you can get buy-in by the community. That's just some... So why is it relevant to North Armco? So you probably heard about it a few times uh, during the presentations, um, certainly in the one that Stan gave um, earlier in the week. Um, there's limited access, access to public utilities at North Arm Cove, and that goes for uh, mains water and wastewater reticulation as well. So um, you have to look at innovative ways to be able to service these communities because um, there isn't standard infrastructure there. Um, the next one, North Arm Cove, is an area of existing natural beauty. Um, and that means that it's very sensitive um, to poorly designed uh, water quality outcomes. So for example, if you find that you're drawing too much water out of the natural water cycle, that's going to have an impact on natural vegetation through the area. So you've got all those beautiful trees. If they're not got enough water, you're going to have an impact on that. Um, and, and also in the same manner, if you're discharging polluted water out into the sea, that's going to have a negative impact on the aquatic ecosystem. So you have to really look at um, good design outcomes here because you've got such a, a beautiful natural um, environment that you're working in. 
So I note down there at the bottom, uh, and I'll read it back. So the, the, the development of the master plan of North Arm Cove offers an unprecedented opportunity to develop a piece-wide integrated water cycle that delivers a sustainable and environmentally sensitive network that increases the livability of the area for residents, visitors, and the natural ecosystem. So there's a real opportunity here, and it's an opportunity you don't often get within um, the construction industry, the development industry, um, where you can actually look at holistic approaches to how you're going to um, deal with the challenges of uh, integrated water cycle management. I will just go through and talk briefly about the, the three main arms of uh, the integrated water cycle management, and I'll start off with um, stormwater. So stormwater, uh, by its very name, uh, talks about water that um, comes during rainfall events. Um, it's water um, and then runs as runoff down through the system um, and out back out to the sea or back to the tree or, a, or a river. Historically, what's been done with stormwater management is it's always been about get away as quick as possible. So it's been a very heavy engineered approach. So as you can see in that image screen there, you're talking about concrete curbs, hard roads that direct the water into big concrete structures and pipes that sit under the ground. That then takes that water and, and gets it out to the downstream water body as quick as it can, right? So that's historically what's been done. But it, as um, we go through um, nowadays to getting more sustainability uh, measures into design, what we're finding is there's a, there's a real drive for more sustainable um, management. So what does stormwater, sustainable stormwater management look like? Um, well, what we're trying to do is look to try and minimize the concentration of stormwater at the discharge point. So quite commonly, when you've got that pipe, those pipe work, they're discharging out, they're discharging out to a river, they're discharging out to the sea at one particular point. What that does is that causes um, it doesn't always cause, but it can cause erosion problems, it can cause pollution problems, it can cause flow, uh, excess flow problems through that, that, that we want to try and get away from, right? So we try to move away from doing that. Um, it looks at minimizing the concentration of pollutants uh, in that water. So obviously, with hard roads, hard surfaces, areas where people are, you're going to have litter, you're going to have. Um, pollution coming off cars. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get in there and clean that water as much as possible before we discharge it. So that the water um, has has the best possible impact on, on the downstream ecosystem. Um, we're trying to maximize the opportunities for maintaining the natural water cycle. So again, we'll talk about it in a sec. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get the water back in to the ground at source. We're trying to um, get it into open water bottles. We're not trying to go down the, just straight through the pipe and out to the sea. Um, and then we're trying to maximize the opportunities for solar harvesting. So historically, it's always been about getting out to the sea, as I've said before. What we're trying to do now is trying to store that water. So can we harvest that water? Can we put it in tanks and then use it when there isn't rainfall events? Can we use it for irrigation? Can we use it to us? Um, other opportunities to do to do that. So when we talk about stormwater management, we can look at a precinct wide um, treatment, or we can look at lot treatment. So I'll go through uh, uh, some examples of, of those now, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. So when we look at precinct wide opportunities, we talk about groundwater recharge. So groundwater recharge, we're talking about getting the water back in the ground at source. So instead of taking it all down the system, we're trying to get it in the, in the ground at source. And you can see over on the image on the um, left-hand side of your screen, um, an example of so what we're doing. And that example is we're taking the water from the street and from the hard stands and feeding it into the, the tree pits. We're using that water to irrigate the trees. And then we allow that to percolate down through the bottom of the tree pit and back into the ground. So then it's recharging the groundwater at source. So that's, that's a good opportunity there to, to do that, on certainly on North Arm Cove. 
Um, rainwater harvesting for public space. So this is becoming more common. So um, what we look to do is we look to actually take the water that runs off the roads and off the hard stands, put it into large storage tanks near public open spaces, and then pump from those storage tanks to irrigate those playing fields or, or uh, public open spaces. So that's, that's something that, that we are doing quite a lot. Water quality treatment. So we're talking about getting the pollutants um, out of the water. Um, so as we increase hard sand, as we increase roads, as we increase foot traffic, we're increasing that risk of polluting water. So primarily what we try and do is filter those pollutants out. So we'll either do that through biofiltration or through filter cartridges within the system. And what they do is they, they pull out the nutrients, they pull out the pollutants, and then the water that discharges from that is clean, clean water. It's not clean water, but it's clean air water. So we're incorporating those into um, a lot of the systems. And then I'll talk a little bit about urban heat um, reduction. So in the example that you've got on the left-hand side where you're storing water for those um, tree pits, any open body of water um, allows for um, evaporation um, is going to help with that reduction in heat island impacts. So what doing is it's allowing you to source, decrease that heat island impact and um, and create a level space. So those are some ideas or, or some of the things that, that, that are available to you in, at a precinct scale. So we go on to lot scale. Lot scale is probably a little bit more restricted when it comes to stormwater just because of available space. Uh, so you do still have groundwater recharge. So as you can see in the image on the left, um, the, the um, storage um, facility um, just beside the wall there on that image, um, which is storing the stormwater runoff, and then it allows that to infiltrate back in through the ground. So you're effectively doing exactly the same as you were on the public domain area, um, but on a smaller scale. So instead of maximizing the discharge out to the street drainage, um, you're, you're trying to get the infiltration as your main um, area charging. We also got rainwater harvesting for reuse. So um, you can trap the water that's coming off your roof, put it in a tank, uh, store that water, and then reticulate that back through um, the property um, for use and non potable for non potable usage, right? So non potable usage that we talk about is is irrigation, it's touching, it's um, using it for your washing machine, um, anything that, that's basically not water uh, for drinking. So that just gives you some ideas there. So here's a project that that we finished um, two years ago now um, in Blacktown in Sydney, uh, where we basically collected all the stormwater runoff from two new playing fields, um, the hard stand, the car park, the um, two um, grandstands there, and we also collected some of council's um, roads or more. We then reticulated that stormwater to a one million litre tank that sit, sits on the grandstand and basically takes up the whole undercroft of that grandstand, uh, where that water is treated and then fed back to the irrigation and toilet flushing for the development. So with this project, we managed to um, feed 80% of the not um, potable re uh, water usage for the site um, through reuse. So it was a really, really interesting project. So now I'll just touch on potable water. So potable water is basically water that you drink. Um, usually, uh, water authorities will supply um, potable water. Um, they'll treat it, they'll reticulate it, um, and then you'll just have a connection from your property to the reticulation, um, and you can not tap and you've got water there. Um, that's not the case at North Arm Cove. Um, there's no real potable water reticulation, um, so it means that we've got to look at alternative methods for, for dealing with that there. So again, wide opportunity. Um, probably the most common um, for rural areas is regional dams. Uh, so with those regional dams, what you're trying to do is either form uh, a new solution um, for retaining water, um, or there'll be natural um, 
depression on the land that you're working with that you can use to, to hold the water. That water is stored there, then it's taken to a treatment plant and then reticulated through to um, potable water usage. Now, certainly on North Arm Cove, the topography would lend itself to regional dams. Um, there are some challenges around that, uh, given that you have to try and reel it to, to locate it somewhere. Um, Obviously, the, the, the topography would allow for that. And interestingly enough, um, if you remember back to the presentation um, that Mark uh, gave earlier in the week, um, where he was talking about how, how do we provide power to the site, and, and there was some discussion about hydro, uh, the two may actually go in line, right? So if you were to talk about storm water for potable water usage, you could also talk about using that to um, create hydro um, electrical power. So that's stands, precinct uh, stormwater harvesting. So we're talking about taking water from a precinct, storing it in large scale tanks. So the top image on the left there are large precinct wide stormwater tanks, and where you can actually store the water, take it to a treatment plant, and then reticulate it back through the potable. Um, and then the bottom one that I've got there is solar desalination, right? So solar desalination is, is a relatively new technology um, in Australia. Um, the reason why um, I, I put solar in there is obviously because at North Arm Cove, there's um, a limit to the available um, power uh, on the site. So what we're finding now is there are opportunities to actually use the sun's power for a desalination plant. So what you can do is you can see there on the bottom image, um, you've got a whole um, solar array, array there that basically the desalination plant, you pull the water out of the sea, um, extract the salt, and regulate it to potable. So um, that's, a, that's a real interesting opportunity. Um, so now we'll talk a little bit about lot scale. So lot scale is probably more common in rural areas, um, particularly in areas that don't have that would allow you to do regional basins. So what we're talking about really on lot scale is ground wells. So you go out on the property, you dig a well down the groundwater, and then you um, insert a pump. That pump will feed out um, a storage tank. Uh, then you treat that water, and that water can be regulated through into your house for potable water. Um, in addition to that, you can also top that up with rainwater harvesting, so your roof can be directed to that storage tank. It then again gets cleaned, treated, and it went to the house for portable. So um, that's, a, that's a lot size um, options that you've got there. So when we're looking at options, what, what should we consider right, when we're looking at portable water? Well, the first one, and probably one of the most important ones, is contamination. So when we talk about potable water, it's water that you drink. Water that your kids drink, it's water that your dogs drink. Uh, so want to ensure that you're maintaining the highest um, uh, cleanliness of that water so you're, you're not impacting on the health of people, right? So as you can see in the image on the left-hand side, uh, there's a, a bit of a break. The risk um, of contamination for certain ways of getting water. Right, so the top is the lowest risk, the bottom is the highest risk. So obviously, main water is the lowest risk because it's treated by the the water authorities and and comes through your, your front door treated. After that, you've got rainwater, um, then groundwater, and then the last one there is surface water. And surface water is the most risky because obviously there's the greatest risk contamination for the groundwater. So you always want to consider. Um, you know, what those risks are on, on health. Land use requirements, we've, we've basically talked about that a little bit earlier. So these infrastructure pieces need space. Um, how much space do they need? How much, uh, where do you have to put them? So things like uh, dams, you want to have them in an area where you can maximize the catchment that's draining to it. Can you fit that in um, on your development? If you've got a desal plant, it probably needs to sit in the sea. People want to have sea views. Um, is it possible to be able to fit that fit that in on your development? Capital investment also. So how are you going to pay for it? Um, are you? Is it something that the community is going to pay for? Is it something that you get a private 
um, enterprise then to look at delivering that infrastructure and then paying them back because um, obviously it's not as simple as getting the water authorities to do that in this particular case. And then ongoing maintenance is going up to that as well. So do you want the community to pay for ongoing maintenance of this infrastructure? The private enterprise is there. Will they have ongoing maintenance? Um, how is that, how is that going to work? So it's just some of the things to consider when you're looking at it. Some uh, typical costs. Um, there are a lot skill size. So stormwater storage. So it's a rainwater tank. Sure, most of you have probably seen that. Uh, you're trapping the rainwater off your roof. So the storage tank, reticulation pump, and pipe work probably cost about five block to install. Desalination plant. Um, if you're putting in a desalination plant for a community, depending on the size of the community and the efficiency that you're getting there, could be anywhere between five and fifteen thousand per lot. The cost. Of it. Um, ground well. If you're digging a ground well out the back um, of your property, probably anywhere between four and fifty thousand to dig that. Okay, so now we'll just touch on wastewater. So wastewater is basically water that's contaminated by human consumption. Um, again, usually collected by the water authorities, um, reticulated treatment plant, treated and then discharged. Um, and also like the potable water, we don't have um, mains here at North Arm Cove, so we've got to look at other issues. How do we deal with the wastewater out here? So the most common in rural areas is septic tank and pit. So usually how that works is you'll have a septic tank sitting out at the back of your property or in front of your property, or the wastewater will go to that. Once it gets full, you'll call someone out, they'll come out with a pump, they'll pump it into a, a, a vehicle storage tank and take it to a treatment plant to be treated. So that's, that's the more common. But what we're finding now is there's more and more um, desire to go into reuse um, and, and recycling. So Grey water reuse is, is one of the uh, things that we're looking at more and more um, in the market. So grey water um, is basically water that you use that isn't from your toilet. So uh, hand basins, um, washing machines, showers, the like, that is, that is what's classed as grey water. So effectively, you can collect that grey water, run it through a treatment facility or, uh, that sits on your hand or a precinct wide. Um, and that can be reticulated back through the home um, and used for surface irrigation, for toilet flushing, and for the aircon. So that's grey water. Black water is like the next step up. So black water basically deals with your toilet water. Um, so again, it's a very similar process, slightly more uh, involved. Um, there's more steps in the treatment. Um, so the toilet water will go through the treatment study and then back through the system, you for irrigation, uh, toilet flushing, and, and so it's worth noting here in both of those reuse um, options that I've, I've put up there, those currently um, under the regulations can be used for potable. So you can't use that to, to put potable water back into the system. Um, you can only use it for non-potable use. Typical capital costs on a lot scale. Septic tank can set you back anywhere between 15 and 20,000. Um, a grey water treatment plant, 10 to 20,000 um, per lot. Black water, we don't tend to do that on a lot by lot basis. It's usually on a precinct basis, and that's to do with efficiency um, of the system. So for a precinct, they're usually around 600 to 700,000 to um, install one of those systems. But what you need to also allow for if you're doing it on a precinct wide um, situation is the reticulation back through. So you've got all your, your reticulation back through the thing that you have to allow for. A couple of examples um, where we've used these systems. Um, there's a project in Landalo where it's a 30 person group home um, where there was no connection to her. Um, it's too far away. So we incorporated a black water system there to filter the wastewater. Um, and then that treated water was used to irrigate the site, which is 2.5 hectares. Um, Mount Toma Botanic, Botanic Gardens, um, there we put in a, a system that was designed to, um, suit, to treat um, wastewater from a peak load of 4,000 people. 
Um, so it was in there to replace uh, an old and, and inefficient um, absorbing bed system. Um, so we put in a new plant, um, and that was really that was used to, to irrigate the gardens. Yala Tef, which is down south of Wollongong, um, was a, a campus that didn't have any sewer connection. Um, so we installed a black water treatment plant there um, to take all the wastewater, to treat the water, and then discharge it to the creek. There was no reuse on this one. Um, it was just purely for treatment and discharge. Okay, so I'm getting close to the end here, so you'll all be glad to know. Um, so what does uh, integrated water management system look like? Here's an example that I've pulled together, um, and it's just in schematic form. So just to look at it there, um, to give you an idea, the light blue arrows are, are clean water, potable water. Um, the orange is non-potable, water is treated, um, and the brown is wastewater. So as you can see, this system that I've set up here, there's three three ways that we can get water. So we've got the storm water, we've got the solar diesel, and we've got the ground wells. So when we talked at the start about diversification of how we get our water, here we are. So we've got three options for getting water in this system. So then you've got the storm water running into the harvesting and the treatment, and then you've got it can be used as potable. Your D-cell running straight into the potable and the ground well, again, going through treatment and then to, into the potable use system. The water that's coming out of that then goes to the recycled treatment plant, um, and then it can be used for non-potable reuse. Right. So as you can see, it's going out to the non-potable reuse on the left-hand side, and then once it's been used for non-potable, it can be recycled back into the, the recycled plant. So you can get a cycle within a cycle there. It can also be used for irrigation. So you can see there it goes to irrigation, and through irrigation, you're going to get evaporation from the surface, and you're also going to get infiltration back into the groundwater. And those that infiltration and evaporation feed back up into the system. So then you can draw it back out again. So what you're looking to do in there is you're looking to recycle as much of it as possible, right? Um, so you'll see from the recycling plant if you if you have too much, then you obviously have an overflow. You can overflow to a water body up for the sea there, but you can overflow to a water body, a creek or a river. So just to give you an idea of what could be done, now that's not to say that that's the best um, options, and, and options will vary depending on your sites, but that's, that's an idea of what, what you could do with an integrated water system. So just to finish off, um, just to summarize on some considerations when you're looking at integrated water cycle management, um, some of the key things to look at, what is the available of availability of authority infrastructure? Is there, is there authority infrastructure there? Do you want to connect to it? Is it worthwhile connecting to it? Or do you want to push towards doing something a bit more, innovative, a bit more sustainable? Um, so that's probably one of the first things that you want to get a handle on. Do you want to do work on a lot scale or on a pre scale? And depending on, on the type of development that you're doing, the topography of the site, um, you know, the, the type of outcome that you want, um, it might be a mixture of both, right? So some things might be better suited at a piece scale and some things might be better suited on a lot scale. So you want to look at your specific project, um, have a look and say, well, what is probably the most efficient use um, on, on this particular project? Capital investment is the next thing. How are we going to pay for all this infrastructure? Is the community on board? Are the community, are the community open to, to paying for this um, infrastructure and getting a sustainable outcome? Or are we just talking about uh, a, historically, um, a historical development where um, the capital investment is try, they try and minimize the capital investment wherever possible? What are the spatial implications? Um, so is the infrastructure that you're proposing going to take up 25% of the developable area? Is that okay? Is that something that the community is going to support? Um, do they want a more livable space? Do they want more open space? Do they want more wetlands and, and um, open water bodies? Um, so you want to have a look at how that's all going to work. Um, and then lastly, but probably you know most importantly, um, what are the impacts um, of what you're proposing on the natural resources and the ecosystem that you're talking about um, is actually going to help um, reducing the draw 
um, of water from the natural cycle? Um, or is it going to impact it negatively? Um, is it going to help uh, maintain the ecosystem? Is it going to, or is it going to become a pollute? So you want to make sure that what you're doing um, is going to have a positive effect, not a negative effect. Um, so there are opportunities there, um, and you know, hopefully, I've you know, an insight into um, what we're doing, um, opportunities are there, and and maybe set your mind thinking on on what you could do on on this project.